When you start thinking about changes that you want to make in the new year, what do they look like? I'm talking about things more than just going back to the gym. 2023 is inviting us to think about what is important to us and what boundaries we're going to put in place to keep ourselves healthy and well-balanced. Part of those boundaries, for some of us, are directly related to health care. Far too many of us walk in a doctor's office and feel like a number, unseen and unheard. Where we go in search of answers isn't working because the intricate mosaic of the energetic, physical, and emotional body that is you is being lost in our current model. I am so excited to share with you the conversation that I had with Taylor Sappington of Tailored Wellbeing. Taylor is a brilliant practitioner, and it was my honor to have her on this show. Taylor and I have firsthand experience with not only the boundary setting, but also how the current medical model can leave us feel unsupported. Let's shift the narrative around our health as we walk into 2023. What are we willing to accept? Where are we going to turn for the answers that we seek? Stay with us. You won't want to miss all the juiciness of this episode. Hi, I'm Adrienne Irizarry. I am an Eastern medicine practitioner who is passionate about women's health and helping women live their best lives. My goal is to put you in the driver's seat of your menstrual health, offering period solutions for a symptom-free life. Statements made in this program are for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitution for medical consultation or advice. We do not claim to diagnose, treat, or cure any diseases. This podcast is inclusive and welcomes all gender identities. The focus of the program is on biological function and we will use the term women throughout, but it is referencing physiological and social challenges for biology, not identity. Come as you are. I am happy you're here and welcome all performances of identity. I hope you find something helpful in this show. So I am so excited for today's guest. She is just an amazing person, an amazing practitioner. I would love to welcome to the show Taylor Sappington of Tailored Wellbeing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. This is a conversation long overdue, my friend. I am so excited to be here. Guys, we had like a warm up to the actual meeting. So we've been talking for an hour, almost, (laughs) but we're here now. We're here and I'm so excited to be here. And I feel very lucky to know you like kindred spirit. Oh, the feeling is absolutely mutual. That is for sure. If you haven't caught some of our previous conversations, you'll want to check out Taylor's podcast, Tailored Talks. We've had a couple of very lively conversations about different parts of the system, how we work in the system, how we work outside of the system. And speaking of the system... This is a really great, yeah, we are. Yeah. (laughs) We're, we're, we're coming to you today talking about how ego affects Mm. care. Can we all just drink that one in for a minute? Cause I imagine there are many people in your listening audience that know exactly what we're talking about. Just being on the receiving end of practitioner healthcare provider that is so out of touch with who they are and so in touch with the power that they have assumed in the position or the role that they now play. Yes. And often to the point where the person on the other side of that desk or in the other side of that conversation really feels like a number and they don't feel seen and they don't feel heard. You know, it's interesting because we have an entire medical industrial complex. That's what we'll call it, right? But we have an entire system that has been built off of metrics, which means just like in, say, the college setting, in many of these university settings, you're a number. I don't know if anybody, you yourself, like, did you attend a college where, like, you were one of 500 in a lecture hall? And was that, like, an effective way for you to learn? I don't know about you, but I was like, I'm drowning, and I need a life raft, and I need one-on-one personalized attention. And I need you to walk me through this concept because I just learn differently. Right. Mm -hmm. And how is that same principle then applied to the healthcare system where you're just a number, you're a butt on a bed in a room for five minutes to check a few boxes as someone types away and stares at their screen to move on. Yeah. 
And when you go into that office, either looking for answers because you've been to several practitioners leading up to this point and mm -hmm. still have none, or you're there because you've had some heartbreaking thing happen in your life. As I'm talking about this, I'm thinking about many women who've come mm -hmm. into my practice who are like, the doctor didn't even acknowledge that I was there because I lost my baby. And th there wasn't even that level of compassion and right. actually seeing the person on the other side of this conversation and saying, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Do you think that they're capable? Like, do you think that there is an awareness? And I don't mean that in the sense that like, obviously a lot of these healthcare providers, all of them, not a lot of them, they're human, mm -hmm. right? But do you think that there has been a degree of trauma that these healthcare providers that you know, have been subjected to that literally changes the way with which they perceive their patient's experience. I think that that is the case for some. Mm -hmm. I think for some, they go into these professions very well-intentioned and wanting to mm -hmm. save the world and take care of people and make a difference. Right. And the model doesn't yeah. allow for them to mm -hmm. really have the full experience of why they wanted to go into medicine in the first place. But I do think that trauma is a factor also, mm -hmm. because when you're dealing with a lot of heartbreaking things day in and day out, the human coping mechanism is to insulate yourself. Right. And whether that's distancing yourself from the people that you're dealing with, or you kind of float through what it is that you're doing so that you're muting your emotional response mm -hmm. to what mm -hmm. it is that you're dealing with. There are a variety of coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that I could see being used in little T and big T trauma situations. Right. I mean, more so too, like, I think that's really valid and accurate and observable, but I mean more so in like the training too. Mm -hmm. There is like this dehumanization in the training and the upbringing of a lot of these medical professionals. And like you said, I do think a lot of them move into the space of wanting to become healthcare providers from a well-intended, you know, point of origin. But I also think there are the people that just want the power. They were the kid that was made fun of in school and they have this big cerebral brain that's really capable. And what a better place and space to utilize that than in the healthcare setting field because it's just going to support obviously the distance that's created between practitioner and patient because there's this complex that's applied in the healthcare setting where the patient is inferior to the superior provider that mm -hmm. is you know giving them care which the whole idea of the care applied in the medical model is something that's wildly skewed in my opinion too i don't know if there is actually any care provided or if a lot of what we see is triage in appropriate situations. I couldn't have worded that better, honestly, mm -hmm. the whole idea of it being triage, because from the moment the practitioner walks through the door, they have 15 minutes with you. And that's exactly what happens. They're trying to figure out your list of symptoms, what's risky, what's not essentially also because they have to worry about massive malpractice and all of that yeah. type of stuff. They're essentially also covering their own butt from Always. a legal perspective perspective and making sure that they have successfully checked all of the, could I get sued for missing this type boxes, which mm -hmm. is a form of triage. 100%. And so I thought you made a really interesting point too about the trauma in the training. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought of it that way, but the moment mm -hmm. you said it, I'm like, Oh yeah, I would absolutely agree with that because, you know, I've seen just in the work that I do, you have people, females, yeah, you have female OBGYNs who sound like a mouthpiece of a patriarchal system, meaning oh, they are regurgitating <laughs> mm -hmm. what it was that they've been taught. Yeah. And this is the mouthpiece. This is the lens with which they have been taught. And so they are recycling what they know. Mm -hmm. Which is so sad to me. <laughs> like, 
It is. Well, I mean, the military does something kind of similar too in the fact that you are supposed to be a good representation of the military organization that you are a member of. There's certain level of expectation in how you talk, how you dress. Excellence. You they call it, quote, excellence. Exactly. But the medical model has the same thing. Your mm -hmm. training creates a certain way that you think and you move through the world. Yeah. And it doesn't actually encourage critical thinking. And I don't know if anyone's paid attention to the last two years. How can you not pay attention? But the grossest pieces of neglect that we've seen in the medical industrial complex, particularly in the last few years, or at least that's how I feel it's been illuminated, no less, is the lack of critical thinking that's actually present in the current healthcare model or the paradigm that we're seeing being applied to patients care. And critical thinking is what allows for practitioners to actually apply individual like plans of care. And when you're given a uniform plan of care that's based on the symptoms that they're trying to triage in 15 minutes, actual medicine isn't practiced. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's not practiced, right? And then you have these repeat patients. I don't know. We saw this a lot in the hospital. They were called repeat offenders, right? But every time they came in, they had like a 30-day window where they could not be seen again. And if they came back in within that 30 days, they had to recode the patient so that the actual hospital wasn't penalized through the various insurance companies because the hospital would either be deducted pay or they would have to offer pay back to the actual insurance company, right? But like the lack of actual medicine and care that's applied in the healthcare system, I think is in part directly associated with the lack of art in medicine these days. I mean, that's one of the things that I love about working with you in these Eastern philosophies is there's art and art doesn't actually allow for ego to mm -hmm. infuse the mm -hmm. practice, right? But there's lack of art in the application and there's lack of consideration of individual factors, Mm -hmm. Well, and the emotional and spiritual body are completely left out of the equation. Oh my God. So yeah. like the way that we pull bodies apart in mm -hmm. order to triage them in it's order reductionistic. To, it so is. And everybody mm -hmm. is in a silo. So mm -hmm. it's hard to get a coordination of care. It's hard to you know, you've got one doctor that deals with your reproductive system. You've got one specialist that will teach you how to breastfeed your baby. You have another person that's going to tell you about why you're tired all the time. But, you know, that doctor could be an ENT. It could be an endocrinologist. Like you could be sent in like one of four different directions if mm -hmm. you feel tired and it doesn't feel normal. So, and none of those offices talk. No, because you sign the paper and your records are supposed to transfer. Often you get there before the records do. And then you have an empty 15 minutes where the person goes, huh, we're going to stare at each other because I don't have your records yet to know your history. It's so interesting too, because as you're saying this, I'm like sitting here thinking to myself, at what point in history did humans become so disconnected that they forgot what it actually means to be a human being? If mm -hmm. we allow it's kind of like letting mother nature do her thing. Like if we stopped trying to interrupt because we are an interruption, okay? And human ingenuity is a beautiful thing. And no parts of this conversation are meant to sidestep the beauty of human ingenuity, right? We probably wouldn't be driving cars without it or mm -hmm. flying airplanes. That's debatable depending on who you talk to, right? Like, <laughs> but there are a variety of, luxuries, we'll call them, that come from human ingenuity. But there's also a lot of destruction that comes from human ingenuity because we seem to think that we know better than Mother Nature without the pure recognition that she's been around for thousands of years and is in no need of us actually staying here to continue to thrive. I think arguably, if we were to be removed, she would be like, damn, I can take a big deep breath and actually hit a reset on my system. And I don't think it's any different when it comes to our ecosystem. There are so many interventions, that's what we call them, but a lot of these interventions are just interruptions. And these interruptions are rooted in 
and somebody coming from a place rooted in ego who thinks that they know better than the body. And I don't know about you, but I am not seeing a positive trend when it comes to the data set associated with the way that medical care, and I say that in quotations, has been applied in the modern centuries. I agree completely with that because I just think about the people that I work with that have Mm -hmm. medications to deal with side effects of medications. And it ends up becoming this jigsaw puzzle of, oh, well, this is a negative side effect of this thing that you're on. So let me give you this other thing to cancel that out. But this thing that's supposed to cancel this one symptom out actually has created three others. So let me give you something else. And it's all cerebral, Mm -hmm. right? And, And we're talking about like symptoms where the body is essentially communicating with you saying, hi, this isn't working for me. Mm -hmm. And the ego in that equation is, oh, well, I am smarter than what the body is telling me. And I have something else that I'm going to try to cover, band-aid, blanket that Mm -hmm. symptom with instead of looking at it as, oh, Houston, we have a problem. (laughs) Right. Well, and if we all got real with ourselves, including the physicians that are applying this care, the band-aid and the blanket is a business plan. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is, I think if most healthcare providers really sat with themselves, right, because one of the draws, at least it was back in the day, I don't know about these days, but one of the draws of becoming a doctor is the money that you make. Now, that's not to say that there's not massive debt that goes along with it as well, too, but there's affluence associated with it. There's stature associated with it, and there's guaranteed income associated with it. And when we really start to talk about the band-aids and the blankets, we have to have an honest conversation as to what would actually happen if we remove the band-aids and we remove the blankets and we went to the root. The reality of that conversation is we would have a happier, healthier populace that didn't actually need the doctor. And that doesn't mean that heroic measures are not going to be needed. Car accidents happen. Bones get broken, right? You know, heart attacks happen. And I tell clients, I'm sure you do too, all the time. Look, if you're having a heart attack, go to the nearest ER. What I have to offer is not going to help you. Now, the recovery period, a little bit different. But no less, I think heroic measures is really where medicine shines. And -hmm. outside of that, we've just created a beautiful business to fuel the gas tank of industries like the pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. Last time I looked at the statistics, Mm -hmm. we spend 19% of our gross domestic product on acute care. It's ridiculous. It's billions. We spend less than 4% on preventative care. Like, I... Are we all listening to this? I think Adrian and I are a little speechless at the moment. But I think the propensity of that statement when you actually understand what it means, and I think part of the plan of this beautiful business that funds all of these, quote, interventions is that we disconnect people to the point that they don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, like cancer, really hot topic. By no means am I an expert on it. But like what? is cancer at a cellular level? Most people can't answer that question, right? It's just a proliferation. It's the poor utilization of stem cells. We keep stem cells in crypts in our gut, right? And when the Mm -hmm. ecosystem becomes diseased, we can't properly utilize the medicine that's been built into us. So now there's a business that's been built off of addressing the poorly managed ecosystem. And the ecosystem is mismanaged because we've encouraged people to disconnect from their bodies. Mm -hmm. This somehow started with ego, but here we are. This is how Adrian and I roll, you know, when it comes to conversation. (laughs) Well, but it totally ties back in because ego disconnects us. Yes. From the care, from ourselves. Yeah. Because we also web MD the shit out of everything. Google is always going to tell you you're dying. You have an extra (laughs) extremity you don't need, or it's going to give you a list of interventions that are completely unnecessary. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not having this conversation from a place of let's demonize the allopathic no. model because mm -hmm. that's not it. What right. it is, is an illumination of where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. Yes. And when I see people walk into my practice and go, I had a stillbirth at 21 weeks and the practitioner didn't make eye contact with me and didn't even acknowledge that I was there because of a loss. Mm -hmm. Or I have the person that has had seven miscarriages walk into their doctor's office and go, why does this keep happening to me? And the reproductive endocrinologist laughs and goes, there's nothing wrong with your test results or your husband's test results, but we can do IVF with ICSI and then walks out the door equally as fast. So that person whose head is now spinning because they expected to get an answer from an expert because we're in a model where we're indoctrinated into this mm -hmm. idea that the doctors hold the answers. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until that moment where we come face to face with their ego mm -hmm. in the instance of the reproductive endocrinologist that I used in my analogy, it's their ego saying, oh, well, but I can fix this with ICSI. When the woman goes, but I've been getting pregnant how does that fix staying pregnant? And he doesn't right. stick around for the conversation. I know this so, is going to sound real sexist too. I mean, so be it. Here we are. Having a man tell me what's going on with my body. Big fuck that. Sorry, guys. Like, I'm like, <laughs> okay. I don't understand all your parts the way you understand them because I don't live with a set of testicles and a penis. Okay. So like respectfully, I only have a certain cerebral... Mm -hmm. understanding of how they work right so I get so lit up and this happens with women too so don't get me wrong like women I almost think at times the female practitioners are worse and the ego mm -hmm. is bigger and there's more violence in the way they communicate than with the males but I have a really hard time wrapping my head around your example where the endo you know the specialist is or the fertility specialist right reproductive specialist is a male not listening to the female who's supposed to be carrying the fetus no less I'm going to do this. We're going to do this. Bye. And it's like, mm -hmm. and your cerebral understanding is glowing right now because you're not even willing to have a human conversation with me. Right. And by the time you get escalated, okay, mm -hmm. because like it, this is a business mm -hmm. and you get kicked up the tears, mm -hmm. particularly if you are struggling with fertility, because this is an area I work in all the time. Right. And I see it with women all the time who right. come into my practice and go, so I was trying for six months. I got put into this infertility program. I've gotten this diagnosis of unexplained infertility. I've- What you know, even is that? Right? Thank you. Because from my perspective- when, It's all explainable when you start to peel things apart. What is that? Right? I do not accept that as a diagnosis. I don't. Mm -hmm. And yet I've seen it all over. And I'm going to use myself as an example. I've seen it all over my chart. And mm -hmm. it is what drove me to become the fertility person that I am now. Right. Because- I was always the why kid growing up and I refused to accept that there was no why, right? For why I was having problems. Why there's I was always having, a why there's always a why. And that's the wisdom that I found in Eastern medicine mm -hmm. minus the ego. It was, well, I was going to say, they don't carry ego. Do you know where Eastern medicine picks up its ego in America? Sorry, guys, but we have practitioners all over the United States that are practicing modalities that they've only gained experience with and from textbooks, okay? And then they're applying this in practice, and there's this American culture being infused with these Eastern practices, and it's not meshing well because now we have these beautiful practices that can be so serving to bodies, you know, across the board that are infused with ego. And that just 
it dilutes the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. If we truly are able to step out of that ego space and get into the essence yes. of the problem, yes. no pun intended for any Eastern practitioners that right. know that I'm talking yeah. about Jing, which yeah. is your essence, right? But like, it's a powerful question to ask. Mm -hmm. And thought provoking in terms of what could it look like? Because my heart breaks every time I have somebody sit across the table from me mm -hmm. explaining all the ways they tried to get help from a practitioner who didn't see them, who didn't hear them, mm -hmm. and sent them out of the room with something that oftentimes didn't even apply to the reason they came in. Mm -hmm. Because there were certain blanket assumptions made, certain standard operating procedures that were followed, which is all part of that triaging process, and then yeah. out the door they went. And every time you have to go back in that door, you are charged a lot of money. Your insurance company may or may not accept it. So you also mm -hmm. have a potential pushing person behind a desk making right. decisions about whether you can have further interventions because, you know, that also further proliferates this idea that you are a number right like I will never ever forget like our plan was supposed to cover three infertility treatments cool I had two mishandled IUIs and so but I didn't know that at the time right now knowing what I know I realized they missed the mark entirely Mm -hmm. No follicular scan, nothing. There was an IUI. It was very difficult to have this all mm -hmm. done for logistical reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And then to find out that the person who pushes the paper behind the desk was saying, oh, this was like three treatments total for the whole life of the plan, not plan year. So if I were to embark on IVF, I had one shot and that was Which it. Which we know- it doesn't work out like that most of the time. And that is ego, not mm -hmm. looking at the human condition. Mm -hmm. And the Do you ever think too, like not to bring this to an, like a too esoteric place, but here we go. Do you ever think too that some of the attempts with these different modalities, like IVF, for example, the body rejects it? Because it's like, this is not the way that it's meant to be. And I'm not ready, or I don't feel safe enough, or I don't think I have the resources I need in order to carry this to term and make it a good experience for me and the soul coming to me. Oh, that is such a great question. I truly believe as an Eastern medicine practitioner that there is a heavenly mandate that is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that it is heaven and earth coming together to create humanity. Yep. And I think that everybody is... should just chew on that for a minute. Heaven and earth coming together to create humanity. I think not only should everybody chew on that, they should chew on it. And then they should look around and start going, what is going on? Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. Because people put tens of thousands of dollars into the IVF process. Yes. And there's not a lot of guidance in terms of supporting mom's body. There's not a lot of education about what these additional levels of hormones are going to do to the body. Or the baby uh, for that matter. Or the baby. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what do birth outcomes look like for people who have had IVF? Um, are there heightened levels of risks during the pregnancy, during the birth? Like, have you don't... seen this? Like, because I have in practice with women who have gone through this process and then they come out on the other end and it's like, what's up? What's down? What's right? What's left? And what goes where? Yes. I have, mm -hmm. and I support people through assistive reproductive technology intervention and right. their outcomes are better. Well, of course, because you're combining the two and I think we're missing the mark. There can be a beautiful marriage of Eastern and Western mm -hmm. and that beautiful marriage can create a lot of positive change. But when we only rely on one system and we mock another, change isn't going to happen. 
not seamlessly and people are not going to get the support that they need. And that's part of the egoic problem too. Why is what you and I do quackery? (laughs) Oh, I wish I had an answer to that because I challenge that Mm -hmm. question every single day because in my mind, Mm -hmm. it's an aspect that has to be there because your medical intervention that you're getting from the allopathic model is not going to work or work as well or have complications if your emotional and spiritual body are not on board. I mean, we are a living example of that as a country. Hello. Mm -hmm. We are embodying that. We're not a sum of parts. No. We are an intricate, interconnected, sovereign being that if we feel like the intervention is against our will, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that not in that you're having something forced upon you, but sometimes you feel like you're in a position where- The only thing you can do. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which does- force that internal intuitive gut feeling that your power is being taken from you or your voice is being taken from you. And when that happens, you are not fully invested in the process. It's it's why when I work with people, I say, here's all of the information. I would love to support you, but I am not a high pressure saleswoman because this practice is not going to serve your highest and best good if you are not fully in all of those facets, spiritually, emotionally, and physically invested in this process. Mm -hmm. You will see the needle change some, but you have to believe it, believe in it, feel Mm -hmm. in the core gut of your body that this is going to serve your highest and best good. And when you believe that in the fabric of your being, you're going to have a very different outcome. It's the same thing with people who have surgical intervention. Mm -hmm. Like if they go into it truly believing that this is what I have to do right now, their outcome will be better. Yep. Then if they go- body is resilient. it, It is. And Mm -hmm. it's it's brilliant. It knows what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. It has disharmonies because we put them there. 100%. That interruption. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. We interrupt it from an ego space. Yep. So again, it all comes back to ego. When we- well, we're so obsessed with mm-hmm. having to quantify everything. Yes. And it's so beautiful to me to watch these modalities that have been around for thousands of years, no less. Like mm-hmm. the medicine that we practice here in the United States, it's only been around for, what is it, 200 years? Maybe. Yeah, it's Maybe. a baby. Yeah, it's a baby okay. In the grand scheme of things. Right. So we look at that and then we look at these modalities that have been around for thousands of years. And I'm like, did they need studies to do any of this? Did they have to have a randomized controlled clinical trial to believe that the application of like, you know, Panchakarma and Ayurveda was going to be effective? Or did they just apply and then apply again and tweak if need be and apply again? And eventually they had a beautiful recipe that just worked. And you know how they knew it worked? They watched it. They watched Mm -hmm. people respond to it. They watched bodies respond to it. They took biofeedback, which in my opinion is the best data Mm -hmm. we could possibly ask for. There is no way that we are ever going to be able to quantify the dynamics of everyday living in a controlled setting. Mm -hmm. We can't do it. So even the data that we do have, right? And I suppose there's an argument for need for data in some spaces. I have a tendency to be like, yeah, If the patient's body or the client's body is telling me that it's a go, I don't need a paper to tell me it's not a go. I don't even know where that thought was going, but like, it's so interesting to me to just watch our obsession with quantification through a controlled study that can't capture what it actually means to be a human being. And that is ego too. 
A hundred percent. That was something that I came up hard against. I'm still thinking about your why is what we do quack. Oh, and, God. yeah, that know, could be a whole podcast. It could totally be. And maybe <clears throat> we should do that. But I was thinking a lot about what you were saying in that vein. And when I first came into Perry Steam Hydrotherapy, there was a lot of challenging yeah. against its safety. Why should you do it? You know, like all of that kind of, it changes your pH, like all of that garbage that's out there. And because it was picked up by some very large media outlets, mm -hmm. people are like, oh, this is doctors saying this is bad. So it must be bad. And I would get clients who would say, well, I found this on the internet. I can't find any studies on it. Like, why should I try this? right? Well, okay. Some of it is the fact that there are studies, but in other countries and we have again, ego, right? If mm -hmm. it's not done here in the United States, it's not good enough. Correct. Instead of, honestly, I would argue other countries are better at performing 100%. studies. Yep. A hundred percent. And I would agree with that. And like some of the studies that I would share with people, because Korean PubMed has some very beautiful literature on this. Mm -hmm. They also have more of an integrative way of yeah. using some of the modality that I use with allopathic medicine for better outcomes. There mm -hmm. was a lot of literature that came out about this integrative approach using allopathic model and Eastern medicine. I mean, even as recently as looking at treating people who had 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 long COVID, for example. So mm -hmm. there is so much wisdom in the ancient art. And there, you know, I used to tell people when they were like, well, there's no data on there about it. And I'm like, well, but it's a 7,000 year old technology. That's a lot of vaginas. My money's on that. No joke. <laughs> and no jo and I think they're like, like, what? <laughs> and I think there's this attempt to erase things too. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just like, if it doesn't fit into our box, we're just going to erase the idea that it exists. And like we were just saying, the information you're looking for is available in other countries. You just have to know what to look for. Oh, and how to find it because most of our browsers are not built to allow us full visibility of what's available for us to actually make an informed decision. And I think that's the hardest part is ego and informed decision walk hand in hand. Because if people are trying to find that information and they can't, or what comes up in the first five hits of a search engine is all negative, 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 uh -huh. because of the number of clicks of that particular engine. Yep. But not even looking at, you know, I think anecdotal and experiential information is invaluable. I agree. It's potent. Because if it's working, it's working. Like, And you usually see it across multiple different people. So like different ages, different ethnicities, different points in their life, different mm -hmm. socioeconomic influence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, if you're getting positive outcomes, mm -hmm. but then you've got an ego voice of mm -hmm. the patriarchal system, even if it's coming out of a female mouthpiece, yep. it's naysaying, mm -hmm. right? When I started putting together a, a training program for Perry Steam Hydrotherapy, I've been working on my own Course, and one of the aspects mm -hmm. of it is to look at some of those voices to be able to critically think right. about the motivations behind it, why they would say it. And the theme that runs through everything that I have found so far is mm -hmm. anyone who says anything from that space has never sat down with somebody that has training mm -hmm. to explain it to them. Why well, that would require work? them to detach from their cognitive dissonance, right? And God forbid we let go of the cognitive dissonance. I don't know about you, but for me, like if you had met me 10 years ago, I had cognitive dissonance, right? Like I had to become chronically ill so that I could personally understand what it meant to be impacted by these modalities, right? So it usually takes some sort of traumatic event for us to mm -hmm. get to this place in space sadly, but the larger body of medicine has this fear mm -hmm. of being really seen. 
Mm -hmm. And if they're really seen, that means that we get to poke holes in their approach. And God forbid we poke holes in their approach because that creates room for other types of support. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they're poking their own holes by refusing to acknowledge that there are other modalities that could be equally, if not more so supportive in conjunction or in lieu of what they're offering. It's supposed to be about the patient. Yes, it is. It's supposed to be about the person coming in for whatever the service or support that they're seeking. And it's not anymore. It's not. It's not. And there's such a disconnect. Sometimes there isn't even eye contact made in the appointment. Like that's how deep that disconnect lies. Mm -hmm. And the people that work with me, even the ones that still are very much a subscriber of getting allopathic support are starting to notice these areas of disconnect and Mm -hmm. feeling less and less of a connection. Like I get asked quite often, can you make a referral for a doctor? Because they know that they need a doctor for some reason. So let's say that they are potentially a high risk pregnancy. They know that they are going to need a doctor. So high risk pregnancy, 3% of pregnancies, just going to put that out there. Okay. We do not need to have cesareans for 97% of the population. That's a topic for another day. But if that somebody- makes me rage in my chest face, so. <laughs> well, oof, man. So, you know, let's say you've got somebody that's a high-risk pregnancy. They'll come to me and they'll go, can you make a recommendation for mm-hmm. an OBGYN? Because they know that they need one for the mm-hmm. safety of them and their baby that is like-minded like me. Mm-hmm. And- I struggle sometimes to make that connection for people because of the way that the system is working. And I have tried to educate OBGYNs Mm -hmm. about what I do, how I do it, how it can be a support Mm -hmm. in what they do. And that it really comes with very minimal, if any, risk at all. You can take the ego out of the doctor, but you can't take the doctor out of the ego, if that makes sense, or vice versa. So like even the doctors, and I commend them for moving away from the space because they're, you know, they're recognizing that the practice that they're engaging in isn't really serving humanity or the greater collective. But like, it's even difficult to find those doctors finding their footing outside of the the space because there's still that indoctrination and that, Mm -hmm. you know, ingrained knowing of I'm a doctor and I know best. And that goes back to the model that they go Mm -hmm. through, that trauma of Mm -hmm. their training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's equally as gross, guys, to observe that outside of the conventional paradigm too. I almost think it's more offensive because you're like, I actually thought you were different. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'm not giving you enough credit. And maybe you are different, but I'm not recognizing that difference in your behavior. I actually thought you were different. And it's heartbreaking when you get to that space because when people- It's another trauma. It is. It's another medical system associated trauma Mm -hmm. that comes out of ego. Yep. And I can't tell you the number of women who they start their conversations with me all from a place of, I went seeking help. I wasn't seen. I wasn't heard. I'm here. I have no idea if you can help me, right. but I'm willing to try because right. what I've been trying isn't working. It is literally the definition of insanity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You keep trying the same things over and over again, expecting different results and you don't get them. Mm-hmm. A different doctor applying the same thing. <laughs> ego thinks that they're actually going to execute differently when in reality the technology is not different Mm -hmm. and once again like you're saying we have a person that's subjected to the same therapy with a different person applying and because the person cannot disconnect from their ego and say you should probably try something different or we should look at another route Mm -hmm. it's like let's do this again different circus same monkeys Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm oh It just breaks my heart because it stands as a roadblock in terms of anyone 
moving forward? Well, then you have to earn trust. And by no means am I averse to earning trust, but sometimes the gauntlet that you're put through as the quote alternative, I find that so disrespectful, by the way, it's the original medicine. I'm not an alternative practitioner. I practice modalities that have been around for thousands of years and are the original medicine. I digress, right? (laughs) But then we're put in a position of earning trust that we didn't lose. Mm Mm-hmm. A hundred percent. When I first started this work, I Mm -hmm. felt like I had to run a thousand miles an hour at every like training certification, further education, anything that was going to put a piece of paper on my friggin' wall. And I hate to say that, but I was feeling pressure. I did the same thing. I get it. You, Mm -hmm. You feel pressured by the system and the fact that the narrative questions Mm -hmm. your competency, your understanding, your ability, and all of these things if you do not have MD after your name. The reality of it is though, and you know this because we've talked about this, but it bears worth repeating. We are usually more competent in broader strokes because we are not so attached to one system and the way that it functions. Everything matters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And nothing works in isolation. And I don't understand why that's such a foreign concept to so many people too. Well, that's how medicine was originally taught. Yes. You apprenticed, you Mm -hmm. learned with somebody. There was an experiential piece like you were talking about earlier. Like this kind of wisdom was passed down generationally, like nothing like it is now. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, like you were taught how to read the body, look at the body. Like I love tongue diagnosis because you're looking at what's right in front of you right then. Yes. It's so interesting. When I worked in the clinical setting, I was in like primary care, the hospital, long and short-term care, palliative care. My favorite physicians to spend time with were the ones that were trained in India Mm -hmm. because they totally approached their patients different and you could see it. Everything was like, what can I visualize? Is there a palpation technique I can utilize? What can I garner from their tongue? The color of their skin, the color of their eyes, the pupil, right? Like what their fingernails look like. They could literally use biofeedback and the canvas that is the body Mm -hmm. to put a picture together. And then they would make their comments about a diagnosis And they would use the technology of the United States to confirm. And it like astounded people. And I'm like, this is what it means to be trained in the fluency of the body and its feedback. Mm -hmm. That is such a beautiful example. I do something kind of similar also because I look at the body One of my clients jokingly calls me the period whisperer because from blood color, presentation, PMS symptoms, all of that stuff, I can tell you what's going on in your system. Right. And then I will tell them to talk to their doctor about these tests, or I'll talk to their doctor about this, or somebody wants to see if their cyst is shrinking or disappeared, or they want to see what's happening with their fibroid. And then I will encourage them. Sure. Go have a scan done, right? Go go get the tangible data. Mm -hmm. And with very few exceptions, because obviously there's a level of compliance and participation on the part of the Mm -hmm. person, right? But you'll see a change. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, my Western allopathic test just confirmed that this quackery thing is actually freaking working. Holy cow. Right. Yeah. And I, I love when that happens. Mm-hmm. I invite people to do that because mm-hmm. I have an unwavering faith in of what I practice. And I know they're going to see the change that they want to see. Testament is the testimonial. Right? Mm -hmm. Like when you are a living testament, you become a testimonial, and that's for everyone. And that's kind of how this has to work, and that's how it continues to work. But there's beauty in that too, because it's not quantification, it's a lived experience. And what's more potent than embodying a lived experience? Mm -hmm. Try to convince somebody who's actually experienced something that it doesn't work. Best of luck. 
Mm -hmm. You're not going to change their mind. They're going to be like, oh, no, no, I did this. I saw a difference. I got better. Things improved. I have tools for a lifetime. It works. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tools for a <laughs> lifetime are huge because you're putting somebody in the driver's seat of their health. And right. that is immense amount of power because part of how this model steals our power is they don't teach us. So we don't know what we don't know. Mm hmm. It's like you and I have talked about like the female menstrual cycle. How many women don't know what length, like, Hey, Adrian, what's the length of your cycle? Four days. Okay. Not what I meant, but thank you. That was great. I need <laughs> to know that too. So that answers my next question, but like first day of bleed to next first day of bleed. Like we don't teach mm -hmm. our girls this, right? Or we teach them that hormonal contraception is the only way to prevent pregnancy. When in reality, that's not the only way to prevent pregnancy. We can educate our daughters and then allow them to make the decision as to what feels best for them. Like we can encourage exploration, you mm -hmm. know? And I think back, even as my journey in this experience mm -hmm. as a practitioner, at the very beginning, I did not realize just how entrenched and indoctrinated I was not even yes. having gone through allopathic medical training. Yeah. I still had this understanding and belief that pieces of paper on my wall validated what I knew letters after my name validated what I do mm -hmm. and that I Okay. So again, all ego. I, I mm -hmm. was a brilliant practitioner that could solve these problems for people. And then I realized and had one of those like moments where I'm like, hold on a second. This is not I, mm -hmm. that is ego. I am not the one doing this. I am the educator. I am the cheerleader. Sister I speaks. The... <laughs> <laughs> I am the coach. I am the confidant yes. because sometimes we talk 1% about what's mm -hmm. going on in the body and the rest of the 99.9% .9 about the fact that they're going through a divorce or they had a loss in their family or their grief. kids breaking out in hives for three straight months, you know, <laughs> like the grief <laughs> around their miscarriage anniversary is coming mm -hmm. up. And then they go, and my period was terrible this month. And I go, but honey, there's a of connection. Of course, your body's going to show up this way because there are these other things going on. And so I've had people apologize to me in appointments and go, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, that's all I talked about the whole time. And I'm like, but that's what needed to happen in this space because right. you needed a place to park that in mm -hmm. order for your body to show up for you mm -hmm. because emotions are energy in our system. They disrupt normal function if we deny them. It's called liver chi stagnation. When mm -hmm. we try to suppress mm -hmm. the fact that we're in extreme grief or we're angry about something or whatever, if we're just trying to put on a stiff upper lip and like look like we don't have anything That's going That's American on, culture. That is American culture, it is Western culture at large. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is this is why we have high rates of heart attacks and other types of things that happen because we suppress this stuff. Mm -hmm. When I see women with fibroids, when I see women with history of cancer, there is very often the theme of a suppressed voice somewhere in their narrative. Mm -hmm. And it's heartbreaking because the body gets that disruption mm -hmm. from its normal brilliance Mm -hmm. And it either doesn't have the energy to show up in the way that it needs to, or there's something blocking it as it's trying to show up the way that it needs to. And if we can just take that out of the way, and sometimes that's just creating a space for emotions to exist. Yes. That's one of our superpowers. We are sentient. We have the ability to emote and we avoid one of our superpowers. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it creates havoc mm -hmm. in our system. Mm -hmm. And so I truly realized at that moment just how deep that ego narrative runs in mm -hmm. the therapeutic space. Mm -hmm. And I realized, no, 
I am not doing these things. I have wisdom and guidance to share, to impart, to help reinforce. But they, this is, again, goes back to the, I'm not a high pressure saleswoman. You Mm -hmm. have to emotionally, spiritually, and physically be invested in this process because all of those parts show up in care. Well, yeah, it's so interesting. You were saying about the certifications in the paper and like, I always have to like giggle to myself when I have this conversation in my head, because I'm like, if you went to a remote village in China or India or Mexico and you spoke to the indigenous community, would they have certifications on their wall? Exactly. This is my point. I laugh and I say no. However, I do know that there are communities where the folk medicine is framed to be a second class citizen and that the people who have money can give birth at the hospital. Right. So that creates, again, that stature Mm -hmm. thing, that precedent Mm -hmm. that if you have to give birth with the plant medicine woman. Oh my God, run me in that direction. That's great. You can have my bed. I'm good. (laughs) Me too. I'll pay for it. Yeah. (laughs) I gave birth at home. Like, Uh and it was a beautiful experience. And Mm -hmm. so yeah, run me in that direction as well. But like, it has to do with the ego and the Mm -hmm. social construct, the narrative that there is around. Yet who do people go to when they're desperate? Mm-hmm. Those of us that do the quackery. <laughs> and then what's the thing that finally puts the period at the end of the sentence? Yeah, absolutely. The quackery. The quackery. Always. Because it's there to work with your body, mm-hmm. not against your body. I always say pharmaceuticals are like that drunk person at the bar. Just like, it's <laughs> so good. Inserting themselves in conversation. Like you're in an intimate, like, conversation with one of your friends, and then you have that person that is one way too close and is too, like, spitting beer in your face. And you're like, I did not invite you to this conversation, (laughs) but you're just going to insert yourself. You're an imposition. Like, pharmaceuticals to me are that imposition. Like, I'm here and I'm coming in hot. We're like, herbs. Teas, extractions, distillations are like, hey, can I stand right here? I'll make myself quiet, right? But I just want to be part of the conversation. I've got your back. I'm here to support you if you need me. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is there not beauty in that? Because I'm like, yo, do you want the beer person or do you want the friend that's like, I'm here for support? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and the support person. hmm changes your experience at the root level Mm -hmm. because you feel seen and you feel validated and you feel safe and you feel heard all Mm -hmm. of those things it's like salt do you know how many people are afraid of salt I'm sure you hear this too like you want me to eat sodium didn't we spend yes the last like two decades villainizing it yeah we totally did but your cells run off of sodium potassium pumps your stomach acid pulls chloride from sodium chloride like hello mother nature didn't make a mistake but do you know the example i use to get it to click today i'm like when you've gone out and had one too many wobbly pops that's what they call them in canada right and you wake up the next morning and you're hugging the porcelain throne because you had (laughs) one too many olipops what do we have the beauty of accessing these days ivs What are they going to do when you go in for that IV? They're going to hang an isotonic solution and rehydrate you. Do you know what's in that isotonic solution? Salt. Salt. (laughs) But it clicks when you say it like that. It's like, oh. Well, and I explain it to people with uh, cravings around their periods because yeah. they're like, Oh, I had all these cravings. And I'm like, okay, so tell me for what? And that question always like surprises people like, Oh, not just sweets. It was weird. Usually that's how it starts. It was weird. I craved potato chips and I was like, you craved salt. Yes. I was like, so that is one of the five flavors in TCM, right? Yep. So like, if you're craving sugary things, it's because your body is looking for sweet. 
Mm-hmm. It's not looking for the candy bar, actually. It's looking mm-hmm. for the sweet potato, but that's okay. Like right. that tells me that we're looking at spleen stomach stuff or salt. We're looking at kidney stuff. Which P.S. I have to shout out Adrian right here, right now, because yes, I work with her and it's been the best collaboration ever. Zero cravings this cycle. Like my period is knocking on the door. I think we're going to make it past a 20, what, four day cycle. Yeah, we've been working on building time in and I have no cravings. The only thing that I have is fatigue. So guys, if you think that steam now, steaming's amazing. I love, I'm kind of sad that I don't get to steam longer and more days in a row, but we have maybe one day, you know, but like, if you guys don't think that this works and I was doing a shit ton of things, I know my body really well before I met Adrian, I needed the support and I needed the tweak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just having the beauty of another lens to look at the same thing. Or having someone else hold space because, you know, as practitioners, we hold a lot of space for people all day, every day. And it's a privilege. That's by no mean a complaint, right? But that also oftentimes means that we're real, like, we're not always that great at holding it for ourselves, you know? So, (laughs) and that is not coming from a place of ego. P.S. The admission right there is, you know, putting my ego aside and saying, I need help. I am the exact same way. I know all the things and Mm -hmm. yet in the execution of holding space for others, I often lose myself. Yes. And I jokingly tell my acupuncturist that she doubles as my therapist (laughs) because I go in and I'm just like, verbal diarrhea with all of the things that are Mm -hmm. going on. Like, you know, my dog died and that grief and this frustration with my teen and this, you know, all of these things. And I'm like, just needle me everywhere. And because I know that it helps her care for me, Mm -hmm. but as a practitioner, there aren't many places I feel like I can safely park that either. I think it's important that you mention this though, because we don't know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And like, we're not here to read your mind or assume. So like, we may be picking up on things, but like, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to go like taking stabs at things until you're like opening the door and saying, come on in, I'm going to share this with you. So we don't know what we don't know. So I'm sure your acupuncturist is like, this is great. I know where to go with all of this and what to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that it up levels her ability to care for me, which is why I share all the things. But it's also nice to have a place to park all of that. Um, I remember at the very beginning of my journey in this direction, I thought I Mm -hmm. wanted to be a music therapist. It's funny how it ended up coming full circle in 20 so many years. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to disclose that number because it makes me feel old. But as I think about where I started, one of the things that she said to me is therapists need therapists. So if you're going to do this work, you need a place for your emotional stuff to go. Mm -hmm. And the more that I've traveled along this journey, I realized just how important that is because that authenticity, that ability to unpack your own emotional stuff helps you to hold space for your Mm -hmm. clients to be able to release what they need that Mm -hmm. isn't serving their journey. Right. A hundred percent. All of that requires you to get out of that ego space and be a container to hold. And this isn't to say that ego doesn't exist in these like quote, alternative healing modalities. How many practitioners do you meet that have to hold on to everyone and be everything to all their clients. And you're like, yeah, I'm just going to sit back here and watch you burn out. Cause eventually you're going to come to learn that that doesn't serve you and it doesn't serve your clients and it doesn't serve their needs. And the superpower is really in collaboration. It really is. It takes a village. Mm -hmm. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to properly care for the multi faceted, multidimensional being that is you. And no joke. I mean, I say this respectfully. I don't want to be all of that to one person. Like the role that you take or the role that I take, it's a privilege. And I'm like, that's enough. Let me, Mm -hmm. you know, like you need a different kind of like, let's collaborate here. And then when we all come together with one person, holy cow, Mm -hmm. infinite possibility, infinite possibilities. And it's 
it's beautiful. Yeah. That's healing. Mm -hmm. That is healing. And then women, typically women, I I have more experience with women. I just don't get as many men saying, hey, I want to run testing and I want to better understand or I want to spend four months with you in an immersion, like fine. You know, but like typically women then go, oh, other women are safe. Mm -hmm. Yep. And other women know how to share. And other women know how to hold space. Because we used to do this. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that heals a wound. A deep-seated wound. Mm -hmm. On so many levels. (laughs) Cam, did we just like peel apart how our ego kind of just dissolved? Is it egoic to say that? Like, hey guys, my ego totally dropped in practice. And let me just toot my horn about that. (laughs) (laughs) But that's why I love these conversations. But because it encourages you to think Mm -hmm. and reflect on what is my role in the whole model in the care of my client, in my yeah. place in their journey, all of those things. Like ego doesn't serve us. Mm-mm. It's a roadblock to growth, transformation, healing, and true essence of who mm-hmm. we are. Could you end on a more positive note? Like, I don't even think I need to say anything after that. Adrian <laughs> just mic dropped. <laughs> I love you. And I love conversations I love you too. like this because, you know, we just are... went all over the forest. We did, but the thread went all the way through it because it it's, did. it's all interconnected. Mm-hmm. It's all yes. interconnected from an emotional, spiritual, and physical place. And honestly, ego perpetuates, as Gabor Mate would say, the myth of normal. Ooh. Nothing that we do is actually normal. And I'm going to leave us with that for you to think about because that is also a fabulous mic drop. So if people were to look to work with you, Taylor, how could they find you? At Tailored Wellbeing on Instagram is the easiest way to find and explore please explore. Please make sure you like the things I put out. Please watch my stories a few times. Guys, I don't hold back on a whole lot and that's not super comfortable for everyone and not everybody loves my approach and that's okay. I'm not supposed to be the cup of tea that's supposed to be in everyone's hand. So Instagram's going to give you a real up close and personal look at the way we, meaning my community, approach this. And obviously we collaborate very intimately with Adrian. So Instagram... It's the place to find me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for another incredible conversation, Taylor. And we're we will keep doing this with each other. So I was gonna say we obviously need to do this again. <laughs> yes, would love to. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Reproductive Rebel Podcast. Until next time. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Reproductive Rebel. Reproductive Rebel is recorded by certified peristeam hydrotherapist, herbalist, sound healer, and Chinese nutritional therapist, Adrian Irizari of Moon Essence, LLC. If you are interested in setting up an appointment with Adrian for one-on-one support, ordering from our store, or checking out our course offerings, visit our website at moonessence.life. Be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to get insider information on upcoming events and offerings. Join the conversation. Like us and follow Moon Essence Me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Your voices make this program possible. Thank you all for your continued support.